David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And if I had the opportunity, I would ask David, why were you glad, David? And I imagine David would say, uh, because if, if I can't find joy anywhere else, I should be able to find it in the house of the Lord. If I can't find encouragement anywhere else, I should be able to find it in the house of the Lord. If I can't find brotherly and sisterly love, I should be able to find it in the house of the Lord. And so it is just a blessing to be here at Westside Presbyterian Church one more time. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, you know, I like people to kind of talk back to me. So <laughs> I still have a, even though I'm Presbyterian, I still have some Baptist tendencies. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But, um. It's just a blessing to be here and just a blessing to meet Pastor Chris. Thank you for your hospitality this morning. And my good friend, Dr. Lloyd Brenner, thank her for the invitation to be with you just one more time. And I also just want to thank my wife for being here, Michelle Williams. Just raise your hand, Michelle. Amen. <laughs> we, on December 19th, we will have been married for 30 years. Amen. Amen. And so I thank her for uh, being here this morning as well. Now, um, one of the things uh, that I'm really excited about is this study on Galatians and also the series that we'll be doing on Wednesday, The Color of Compromise. In many ways, they are interrelated. Uh, and I want to operate under this theme, living in gospel unity, living in gospel unity. And uh, I, I chose that theme because uh, unity may mean one thing to the world, uh, but it means something altogether different uh, to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, it, it implies deep fellowship, it implies uh, uh, deep worship, and the unity that we experience is through Jesus Christ, uh, which is a deep and profound sense of unity. And so for the next few weeks, we will take a journey with Paul to explore his letter to the Christians in Galatia. And it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we experience unity and harmony in the deepest sense of the word. The world in which we live knows nothing about this type of unity. It is my prayer that we will grow deeper and uh, into this reality of unity that can only be realized and actualized through the gospel of truth. Our scripture passage today is taken from Galatians 1, verses 6 through 12. And I want to hang as a title over this, The Holes in Our Gospel. Uh, let us look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. You will find these words I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are, we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people. If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. 
I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God lasts forever. In 2009, Richard Stearns wrote a very thought-provoking book entitled The Whole in Our Gospel. And some of you may be familiar with that book. And at that time, he served as the president of World Vision. He is now retired, but the book made a major impact uh, on the evangelical church and continues to do so. The basic thrust and motif of the book attempts to answer the question, what does God expect of us? Stearns contends that God expects more from us than just going to church, saying a few prayers, avoiding the big sins, and believing the right things. The big idea in the book is basically uh, the belief that being a Christian requires much more than just having a personal relationship with God. He contends that it also entails a public and transforming relationship with the world. God changed the world 2,000 years ago with 12 men, and he can do it again. If only we would give ourselves fully to the task of being the good news and bring compassion, reconciliation, and justice to a world ravaged by political division, violence, disease, hunger, and oppression. I would concur with much of, much, with much of what Stearns argues in, the, in his book. But I would go even further in the sense that there is more than one hole in our gospel. There are glaring holes in our gospel. Just the other day, I, uh, I was putting on a shirt, uh, getting, getting dressed to go to an event, and I pulled one of my favorite shirts uh, out of the closet. I began to take a closer look at it and discovered that it had several small holes in it. I didn't know uh, who the culprit was or how long they had been there. Uh, it would be embarrassing to wear a shirt with multiple holes in it. Amen, somebody. <laughs> but there was no way I could fix or cover the holes up. They were up front. And as I, I was so disappointed, but needless to say, uh, I chose to wear another shirt. And as I thought about my dilemma, I began to reflect on Paul's scathing letter to the Christians in Galatia. Uh, there were glaring holes in their gospel, and they didn't even know it. They had put on a gospel shirt that had holes in it. Paul, in so many words, tells them that there are holes in your gospel and that I didn't put them there. Paul says, when I left Galatia, uh, the, the shirt I gave you, the, the gospel I gave you, had no holes in it. The gospel that I proclaimed and lived among you is a gospel that I received from Jesus himself. It's a gospel with no defects or holes in it. And so I would submit to you today that, that we should take a closer look uh, at the text and see how Paul dealt with this issue 
Because I believe that Paul has something to say to the church today. That there are holes in our gospel and some of us, if not all of us, don't even know it. And as we think about this passage of scripture, I just want to point out the holes that Paul pointed out in this, in this gospel and, and to the Galatians because what had happened in Galatia is Paul had planted a church there in his first missionary journey. Uh, it was a fresh church. It was a vibrant church. And, but soon as Paul left, there were a group of teachers, false teachers, who were called Judaizers, who came in and began to tell this new church that not only do you need the gospel, but you need the law as well. Not only do you need the gospel, but you need the Mosaic law. You need to add the ceremonial laws. Uh, you need to add uh, keeping the Sabbath and all of these laws that Jesus said, I came to fulfill. And they were a foreshadow of what was to come. And so here, Paul, it, and when you read the, the tone of this, of this letter, that, that Paul is upset. He's bothered by what has happened at this church in Galatia. So look at what he says in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. First thing that Paul points out is there is a whole of unfaithfulness, of unfaithfulness. Look at what he says. I'm astonished that you so quickly deserting the one who called you. See, Paul understood that, that this gospel that he proclaimed is not a gospel that's rooted and grounded in religion, but it's grounded in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when Paul left Galatia and went on his second missionary journey, he emphasized the importance of a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Paul tells them, remember who called you. Remember Jesus called you even though I was an instrument by which I pointed you to Jesus, but remember who tugged on your heart. Remember who rem removed the veil off of your eyes. Remember who expressed his love to you on the cross. Paul says, remember who called you. Sometimes we have to remember that we were not called by the Presbyterian church. We were called by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, our mother, uh, our fathers didn't call us. They pointed us in the direction of Jesus. They can't save us. But at some point in your life, whether it's through confirmation classes, whether it was through a friend or someone, God exposed you to his gospel. You, you, you were exposed to the gospel and Jesus called you into a relationship with him. So he tells them, remember who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. But not only that, he says, don't, don't abandon the grace of Christ. It, it, it is the, the letter, Paul's letter to Galatia is what we call the gospel of grace. And there is this tension in Galatia between the law and between grace. And Paul tells them to put your weight down on grace and take your foot off of the law. Put your weight down on grace because it is through grace that you have been saved. It is through the God's unmerited favor you have been called out of darkness. And so he says, don't abandon the grace of Christ. Don't abandon his love for you. Don't abandon the, the day that Christ called your name and that he whispered in your ear and said, this is the way, follow me. 
Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded of who called us. We need to, need to be reminded of the grace of Jesus Christ. And Paul continues uh, throughout his letters to emphasize the importance of grace. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But also he says, don't abandon the true gospel for a false gospel. Don't abandon this true gospel for a false gospel. He says, I I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And what Paul is really emphasizing here, that this gospel, that, that to, to reverse the gospel and to go back to the law is to undo what Jesus has done in our lives. It it's, it's to reverse the gospel. And he says, don't abandon this true gospel. But you see, the, the background of this, as Scott McKnight points out, that there is a Jewish ethnic nationalism that is being perpetrated here. And there is, there is these Judaizers are saying that uh, we are, uh, because of our Jewish ethnicity, that we are on a higher level than you, and if you want to be accepted into our community, you've got to keep the law. You've got to keep the Mosaic law. Paul says, wait a minute here. Jesus came to abolish the law, the law, and we'll see later in, some, in, in the next chapter that the law was a school teacher. It, it, it was a schoolmaster that uh, help them to understand the gravity of their sin and help them to understand how far uh, away from God they were and that the law was a teacher, but the bell has rung and Jesus has showed up on the scene and instituted grace into our lives. Amen? Amen. And so we, we have to be careful of of this sense of ethnic nationalism that's even being perpetrated in our in our uh, in the United States today, we hear the term Christian nationalists, brothers and sisters. That is antithetical to what the gospel talks about. It's antithetical because God, through Jesus Christ, created a new ethnicity called Christians. And, and we are citizens of heaven first and citizens of earth second. And our heavenly citizenship dictates how we behave in our earthly citizenship. It's not the, the other way around. We march to the drumbeat of a divine drummer. And that is Jesus Christ. We, don't, we do not march to the drumbeat of a, of a political drummer. We do not march to the drumbeat of a Republican drummer. We do, do not march to the drumbeat of a Democratic drummer. We do not march to the drumbeat of a Christian nationalist drummer. We march to the drumbeat of a divine drummer, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? And so there is a, a danger in flirting with a different gospel, is what Paul is saying. A gospel that overpromises and underdelivers, and what really, what they were really doing, these Judaizers came in and they came in with fake news and not faith news. They they came in not with good news, but they came in with a news that was antithetical to the gospel that Paul had 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 taught the the Christians in Galatia. So there was a hole of unfaithfulness, but not only that, there was a hole of divisiveness, divisiveness. Look at verses 7 through 9. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They want to pervert it. They want to distort it. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you. Let that one be a curse. 
The, the Greek word there is anathema, uh, that he's saying, God, you deal with them. And, and as we have said, he says in verse 9, as we have said before, and now I say it again, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let that one be a curse. And in my Bible, it shows an exclamation point behind a, cur a curse. So Paul is speaking with a lot of passion here. Uh, Paul is speaking from a, a position of apostolic authority here. Paul is saying, uh, I, I, w I, I didn't just, I wasn't, I wasn't someone who just went. I was sent by God. I was sent by God. And so he tells them, he tells the, the, the church in Galatia, beware of doctrinal troublemakers. Beware of them. Because what they will do, they will twist the truth. They will tell enough truth for you to, to draw you in, but then they will add something to the truth. And they stir up trouble, dissension, and confusion in the church. So he says, beware of doctrinal troublemakers. He says, I, I've given you enough to, dis, to discern truth from error. I, I've given you enough to, to know what the gospel is, and, and, and if you can't see this, then I need to take you back to the basics. And so that's what Paul does in Galatia. He takes them back through the basics and he reminds them what he has deposited it in them. So he said, beware of those who add to the gospel. I don't know about you, but there are times when I watch television or there are times when I watch uh, these televangelists that it seems to me that they are adding to the gospel to make their message seem like God has given them something extra. But what Paul is implying here is that I am sharing with you what I received from Jesus Christ. And, and when Jesus gave this message to me, uh, I was called to be faithful to what he has given I was called not to add to it, not to take away from it, but to treat the gospel in its complete form. Jesus, when he died on the cross, when he rose again, he never gave the disciples anything to add to the gospel, but to clarify what this gospel mean, looks like in everyday life. And so he, he says to them, Be, beware. Those who add to the gospel, the gospel that Paul preached is a gospel that promotes unity under the lordship of Christ. So the gospel, brothers and sisters, is something that always promotes unity, not divisiveness. That the gospel to us as Christians, it, it promotes unity. And Paul emphasizes this letter by letter that the gospel promotes unity, it brings about peace, it brings about love for those who are part of the body of Christ and that we must sit under the lordship of Christ because at the end of the day, the gospel declares that Lord, that you are Lord, that Jesus is Lord and he's the only one that demands or that we should be sitting under his lordship. And, and so we, we, we have to understand this because sometimes when we read the gospel, sometimes we, we have, we, the gospel rubs us the wrong way. Sometimes Paul's letters rubs us the wrong way. But Paul is really throwing his apostolic weight around here. He's really telling them that these Judaizers that came from Jerusalem, they were not called to be apostles. Uh, these Judaizers do not have the credibility that I have. Uh, and he's saying to them that when I speak, when I write, I carry with me the apostolic authority that Jesus Christ has bestowed upon me. And we read in, in the book of Acts, in that first, first two chapters, it says that the early church gave themselves to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to the apostles' teaching. 
which means that there is a, a rhythm, there is a communal formation that takes place every time we come together as a church. The confessing of sins, the, the prayers of the people, the singing of the songs. Every time we come to church, there's something that happens. God is shaping us into in community. And so don't miss it. Don't miss it when the confession of uh, the prayers of confession are prayed. Don't, don't miss the words. Don't, don't miss it when the prayers of the people are prayed. Don't miss it when the songs of Zion are sung together. Engage in the worship experience because God is shaping us and making us look more and more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. So there's a whole of divisiveness. He says, check yourself and make sure you're not unfaithful. Check yourself and make sure that you are not causing division in the church. Check yourself and make sure that you're sitting under the apostolic teaching of Jesus Christ. Uh, check yourself at the door and make sure you're not bringing any division in the church yourself. Amen? And that means we brothers and sisters, we must do a reality check from time to time. That, that means sometimes, that, that, as one writer said, that the unexamined life is not worth living. And so we must examine ourselves and make sure that we're promoting unity and not division. Making sure that we, we are promoting faithfulness and encouragement and not division. Because all of us, brothers and sisters, are under construction. All of us are under construction, and who are we to tear down what God is building up? And, and if God is building the brother or sister up next to you, don't tear them down. They need to be encouraged. They get enough discouragement from the world. So they, they, they don't want you uh, discouraging them because they come to the church for encouragement, not discouragement. Don't tell them how bad they look. Tell them how good they look. Amen, somebody. So there is a hole of divisiveness, and we must check ourselves at the door. Last but not least, there is a hole of legalism. Look at what he says here in verse, verses 10 through 12. He says, am I now seeking human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. It didn't originate with, with humans. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul is, Paul is telling them that, that the gospel I preach, I, I, don't, I don't come, I didn't plant this church to be approved by the Judaizers. I, I, I didn't plant this church to be approved by you. He, he says, ultimately, God is the one who puts his stamp of approval on me. Uh, Paul is angry here. He says, am I trying to please people? Am I trying to please you or the Judaizers? Uh, he said, there was a time I, I tried to please people as, as a Pharisee. I, I tried to please the Sanhedrin. I tried to make myself up the ranks uh, as, as a Pharisee. But he said, but now I am a servant of Christ. Remember who you serve. Remember that Titles at the end of the day in the church doesn't matter. At, at the end of the day, all of us are servants. At the end of the day, the pastor is a servant, the elders are servants, uh, the choir members are servants. Every member is a servant of Jesus Christ. And, and you know, the, the thing about trying to please people, brothers and sisters, people are fickle. What they want today, they don't want tomorrow. They change their mind. So why spend your time trying to please people? 
But my Bible tells me that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Which means that Jesus is not fickle. He's not moody. He doesn't change his mind. What Jesus said yesterday, he says today, and he says forevermore. In other words, you can trust Jesus. When you go to Jesus in prayer, he never says, I changed my mind. <laughs> Amen, somebody. And so Paul is saying here, he's addressing the heretical teaching that has infiltrated the church he planted in Galatia. Uh, a, a group of these false t teachers sent from Jerusalem to evaluate and audit the church and, and to check on what Paul has taught. But they did not have that authority. And so th they taught that in addition to accepting Christ, you must also submit to the law of Moses as a necessary step in being pleasing to God. Uh, Scott McKnight, as well as N.T. Wright, calls this Judaizing legalism. Judaizing legalism. It, it, this teaching is really antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it undermines the finished work of Jesus Christ and the continuing work in our lives. Legalism w was wrong then, and it's wrong now. Uh, legalism really says, brothers and sisters, that, that it implies that in order for you to be accepted into church, you got to look like me, you got to dress like me, you got to talk like me, you got to speak Christianese like me, you got to do certain things to be accepted into this church. And this is not the gospel that Paul was preaching. Legalism uh, teeters on a gospel that divides us, not a gospel that unites us. It's a gospel that's based on the works of, of the law, and it's a distorted gospel. But here's the thing, that the ultimate goal of the gospel is to make us whole. Not to point out the holes but to make each and every one of us whole. So recognize that the holes of unfaithfulness, or the holes of divisiveness, or the holes of legalism. Examine, let us examine ourselves as Christians and as a church that make, to make sure that we don't have these holes in our lives. Paul says, I left the gospel uh, to you in, in its totality, and you don't have to add anything to it. It is a gospel of grace. Paul says this over and over again, that it's a gospel of grace. You know, years ago, I, at the former church that I served at, there was, a, there was an old deacon there. He lived to be 98 years old. His name was Deacon Kelsey. And Deacon Kelsey was the kind of deacon that he, he, he loved to strike up a conversation with you. And he was, the, he was the custodian of the church. So he would set up, even in his old age, would set up tables and chairs for our meetings around the church. And he didn't want anybody to help him. He was, he was strong as an ox. He, was, he would grab my hand and we, sometimes we would try to see who's the strongest. And I would have to give because he was so strong. But the day came for Deacon Kelsey to kind of uh, retired from being a custodian. So his family came to me and said, uh, Reverend Williams, uh, we, we want our dad to, to re retire from doing this kind of work, but he won't listen to us. But he'll listen to you, Reverend Williams. So I brought Deacon Kelsey, Deacon Kelsey into the office and I said, Deacon Kelsey, you know, you, you have been faithful as a, as a custodian here. You've been faithful as a deacon and your family has asked me to to ask you, I'm not going to demand it, but uh, to ask you to retire. And he began to think, and he looked at me kind of strange, and I said, they're concerned about you, Deacon Kelsey. They, 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 want, they want to make sure that you live a little while longer. They, they don't want you to continue to lift all of these heavy tables. And, and so he said, I, I, will, I will do as you request, Reverend Williams. And after that, 
uh, Deacon Kelsey, we hired someone else to do the work that he, that he did. And they would, they would set up tables and everything, but every night, uh, closing the church and opening the church, he did that as well, but every night, he still showed up at the church. Nine o'clock, he showed up at the church. And I said, Deacon Kelsey, what are you doing here? And he says, Reverend Williams, I just want you to understand that I'm a grace man. He said, the work that I do here around the church, I don't do it to get paid. I do it because of God's grace. I do it because of God's unmerited favor to me. I do it because God has allowed me to live to see 98 years. I do it because God has been so good to me. And so I come up to the church because I'm a grace man. And I thought about that and I said, wouldn't the church be so much better if we had some grace men and grace women, grace elders, grace Christians, grace choir members, that the church was saturated with God's grace. That when people came through, through the door, they would feel grace in the air. That, that's the kind of church that draws people when they smell grace, when they see grace, when they see a smile of grace on somebody's face. I want to encourage you today, to thrive, to be a grace woman, a grace man, a grace father, a grace husband, a grace wife, a grace child, a grace elder. Be someone who lives a grace-saturated life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and for whose we are, that we are your sons and daughters. And Lord, we thank you for the love that you poured out on us that we should be called the children of God. And Lord, we thank you for this grace in which we stand. So Lord God, may we uh, continue to live a life that's not focused on legalism, but focused on grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.